Jeff. Welcome to another session of ASM Live coming to you from New Orleans. We're at the 2011 ASM General Meeting, and I'm Jeffrey Fox, Features Editor of Microbe and the host of these live sessions. Uh, we uh, invite listeners and uh, viewers on the web and anyone in the room to ask questions as we get into the session. We ask that you identify yourself by name and institution. Uh, to ask questions from the web, use hashtag ASM2011. Uh, in this session, I'm going to be talking with Jennifer Gardy. She's from the British Columbia Center for Disease Control, and we'll be talking about some of her recent uh, work using genomic sequencing and also some social networking or some of that newfangled stuff to track down a tuberculosis outbreak in uh, locally in Vancouver. Um, so with that, uh, Jennifer, if you would start by giving, giving us something of a summary, a brief summary of the high points, and uh, then we'll, we'll get into the questions. Sure. Um, what we did was pretty much one of the first studies in this emerging area of what we call a genomic epidemiology, and we've got a symposium about that uh, this afternoon here at the conference. And genomic epidemiology is essentially uh, applying whole genome sequencing as a molecular epidemiological tool to reconstruct outbreaks of infectious disease. And it's not a new idea. People have been doing it um, with viruses for a little bit, but until recently it was virtually impossible to do it for uh, bacterial outbreaks just because of the large size of the genomes and the large number of cases you were dealing with. It was too expensive. So this was one of the first studies to use whole genome sequencing as a molecular epi tool to reconstruct an outbreak of bacterial disease. Uh, we did a tuberculosis outbreak and were able to quite accurately um, reconstruct the transmission events that happened and basically figure out how the disease got into the population and how it spread. And a few interesting things fell out. Uh, the role of super spreaders, um, the role of a social factor in triggering the outbreak break, uh, which was a spike in crack cocaine usage in the community in the preceding year. Our uh, investigation revealed that was sort of the trigger for the spread. Um, and yeah, it, it was kind of an interesting first pass. It was a good learning experience for us, and um, we're now applying that exact same technique to some other TB outbreaks that are going on uh, in BC and uh, in collaboration with colleagues around the world. Okay, that's a great summary. Uh, I. I I guess I want to start first by asking how valuable uh, taking a genomic sequencing approach proved to be compared to doing something that was, you know, molecular markers of, of a more constrained mm -hmm. sort <laughs> instead of the grandiose genomic sequen sequencing, which, you know, I'm not, I, I, I think I want to dig a bit as to why, why, why? you took that <laughs> approach and how it how it, where it led you and how it proved valuable. Sure. So um, with this particular outbreak, um, when it started in 2006, uh, the technique that we used to do DNA fingerprinting was RFLP. And all of the isolates... And you want to... You, you better tell people yeah. what RFLP <laughs> Restriction is. Fragment Length Polymorphism. Not um, that that helps. No, but, it's okay. a DNA fingerprinting <laughs> approach. So hopefully our audience is reasonably familiar with it. Um, is that me that's clicking? I'll move that there. Uh, so RFLP was our first approach, and using that, all of the isolates had an identical DNA fingerprint. You couldn't tell them apart from each other. You knew that they were all part of this one outbreak, but you couldn't distinguish them any further. Then a couple years later, we replaced RFLP with a more high-resolution technique, something called um, MIRU, which is Mycobacterial Interspersed Repetitive Units. Uh, and that's basically a more sophisticated DNA fingerprinting technique for M. tuberculosis. And again, all of the outbreak isolates, we had 41, 
were absolutely identical in terms of their genotype. So there was no way of distinguishing any sort of subclusters within the outbreak. And it was a really difficult outbreak to reconstruct because it occurred in a really tightly knit um, community where everybody knew everybody else and everybody was hanging out at the same locations. Ordinarily in an outbreak, you can go do field epidemiology, interview people, talk to them about, um, you know, where do they go, who do they see there, what, what might have they been doing in places, what food items might they have eaten, um, you know, your basic field epidemiology investigation with, when complemented um, with molecular epidemiology data, can usually give you kind of a best guess reconstruction. But because all of these isolates were genotypically identical and because everybody knew everybody, we couldn't use our traditional methods to figure out, okay, well, it might have started with this person and then spread to this person and then to this person. So we basically had no idea whatsoever beyond the first few cases how this outbreak had spread. So with whole genome sequencing, um, you're able to look at the entirety of the genome as opposed to the roughly sort of 0.03% that you look at when you're using a DNA fingerprinting technique. And it opens up this tremendous window onto genomic diversity. And all of a sudden, an outbreak population that was totally clonal and totally identical with genotyping can be divided into a number of distinct subclusters, which then really take your existing epidemiological information and make it that much more interpretable. So in a way, you were, you were doing something akin to what happened with the uh, US anthrax investigation, mm. trying to reconstruct how, how a, uh, probably a single point, or, I mean, a, a single uh, person was infected and then the, the infection spread from that person in to several others. And I mean, can you, can you kind of fill in some of those blanks as to how, in your case, the, uh, the tuberculosis uh, bug spread to from through that community. Yeah, what we found with ours, this was really interesting. We went into it um, sort of thinking that there would probably be one source case that probably seeded a couple other cases who in turn would seed some other ones and we'd get kind of this radiating pattern of transmission. But what we saw was really interesting. Um, the first thing that was fascinating was that there were actually two distinct clusters of tuberculosis going on. Genotypically, they were identical, but at the whole genome level, there was just enough diversity to um, bin all of the isolates as what we called either lineage A or lineage B. And so this suggested that there wasn't just a single source case for the outbreak, but there were at least two, one that seeded the A cases and one that seeded the B cases. And when we looked further, it actually looked like within the B lineage that was a larger group of the cases, they were about uh, two-thirds of the cases, it looked like there were in fact two key individuals. So in this particular community, um, TB was nothing new. It had um, occurred at levels of about one or two cases a year for decades prior to that. And what we suspect happened is that those three individuals, the one from lineage A and the two from lineage B, were probably latently infected there had been a large outbreak um, of the same genotype, I guess, about five years prior to this. We figured they were probably infected then. And something triggered the simultaneous reactivation of these cases at around the same time. And simultaneous reactivation due to a shared environmental stressor is something that we do see quite frequently in tuberculosis. So it wasn't tremendously surprising. And when we dug around for what that trigger might be, uh, it seemed like the most logical explanation was um, that town got really into crack cocaine in the couple of years prior to the outbreak. The, um, the case rate, well not the case rate, the um, number of cocaine related police files in the community, if you draw that over the epidemic curve, it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, really interesting correlation there. And most of the outbreak cases were crack cocaine users or were hanging out with users in crack houses or uh, other locations. So basically you had three people that were infected, reactivated at about the same time due to this shared environmental stressor, and they were operating in a very tightly connected social network, and it was essentially a perfect storm for TB to spread. Well, let, let me, uh, when you say environmental stressor, you're, you're using uh, a, a kinder term to say that the, the, their use of uh, 
of an illicit drug was helping to make them sick to reactivate the the, the MTB. Is that what was going on? Or, yeah, uh, okay. probably. So they, they were... Uh, now, I did, I did want to ask a couple of subsidiary questions from that. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, was their drug, as, as I, I assume there was some effort to treat these patients, and what was their drug resistance? Was that a complicating factor in the circulating strains of, of MTB? Happily, uh, no. This was a strain that was entirely susceptible to okay. all the frontline drugs. And with the exception of one or two people, everybody was quite compliant with their treatment up front, and the few that weren't uh, were sort of brought on board fairly quickly. Okay. That, and the other question that I was uh, uh, thinking of uh, is whether there, in as much as th there was use of crack cocaine, how do you keep the sort of the criminal side of you're, you're, you're getting you're tracking <coughs> evidence that could be used in for criminal uh, prosecution purposes uh, whereas you're collecting it for epidemiology but were, were you under any pressure from the local law authorities to divulge data that otherwise would be considered medical and and uh, should be kept private I would think uh, no, we weren't under any pressure at all because I think they were, they were acutely aware of there was a crack cocaine problem in the town. We were aware through our social network interviews that these individuals were using crack cocaine, but it wouldn't serve the police, you know, it wouldn't do them any good for us to say, oh my god, this person is reported using crack cocaine because in that community they already knew who the crack users were, who the dealers were. There was no information that we could provide to them, and even if they had asked, we wouldn't have done it. I mean, it's not ethically correct. No, I, I realize that. I, I just, it, it does, the, the sort of detailed information that you're collecting in, in a situation of this sort would be, uh, would be potentially useful in a, in a, a courtroom setting. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, you know, in some situations, it could be a problem that pressure might be brought to bear on, on your group of epidemiologists who are doing what they're, they should be doing professionally. Now everybody left us alone. It was quite nice. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I have another question about the, the genomic approach mm -hmm. you took, where you, as you rightly say, it's very rich with data and information. And I'm kind of curious that once you you've established that richness. Can you point to uh, parts of the genome that were, the, were hot spots of change? And so that if you were to do a follow-up analysis, you might not need to do a full genome sequence. You could go to those hot spots that you've identified. Or, or are they not universal? Or have I misconstrued what yeah. you might have found? I, no, that's uh, a, it's a good point, actually. Um, I think. There's sort of a two-part answer to that question. I'll answer the second part first, which is, um, you know, would we do that focused approach in the future? Maybe, but the cost of whole genome sequencing is dropping so much that, um, you know, it's going to be just as cheap to sequence a whole genome. Uh, the bottleneck is sort of in the data interpretation, but it'll be just as cheap to sequence a whole one than to have a tech working on a whole bunch of PCRs and sequencing. But uh, to answer the first part, where we did see the largest number of single nucleotide polymorphisms, which was what we were looking for, sources, well, basically points in the genome where there was variation that could distinguish the isolates from each other. Um, Certainly the hot spot, and this is by no means surprising, uh, was the PE-PGRS family of genes. And this is a family of highly repetitive genes that encode uh, a variety of proteins. There's hundreds of them in the genome, um, some of which are thought to be involved in antigenic variation and other sort of immune-facing functions. So it's no surprise that they were designed to be repetitive and accrue mutations quickly. The problem is, though, with next-generation sequencing technologies, they generally don't like repetitive regions. Um, you can get sequencing errors introduced, you can get assembly errors introduced, so you have to walk this fine line between 
recognizing that those regions of the genome are extremely interesting, subject to selective pressures that give you a lot of accrual of variation, which can be really informative, but you have to recognize that some of the variation you might be seeing could be artifacts of the sequencing process. So how we dealt with that in this study is we did um, all our analyses on two separate data sets, one where we included all of the SNPs that we picked up, um, and we did apply very stringent quality filters. Um, so we did one analysis on all the SNPs, and then we did a second analysis uh, using only the SNPs that were in non-repetitive regions. And we're doing, uh, as I said, a second outbreak right now, and that'll be really interesting to see if any of the things that we saw in the first set of SNPs, you know, particular genes, are those recapitulated in the second outbreak from an entirely different origin. So the, it's a new, a new outbreak, and it's a different community, I'm, I'm assuming. Totally that. unrelated, this one, yeah. It's a different community, a uh, different geographic region in the province. It's a uh, different Miru type, and there's also, uh, with this current outbreak, an interesting issue of antibiotic resistance. Uh, some of the isolates are isoniazid uh, resistant, and some are susceptible, so we've got this really interesting kind of mixed pattern that uh, our initial investigations into which um, mutation might be responsible for that uh, resistance, have revealed none of the known mutations too. So in this new outbreak, we've got something that whole genome sequencing is really our only hope to find uh, in terms of this new resistance mutation. And you think that that resistance is developing as the, as the microorganism works its way through different uh, individuals in the community, or was it already established, possibly? It was already established. What we think is happening with this latest outbreak, and which is why we're so excited to see the genome data, which should be coming in um, probably about two or three months from now, um, is it looks like our source patient in this latest outbreak is somebody that um, was sort of colonized with a mixed population. It was somebody that wasn't very treatment compliant, and so we've got serial cultures from the patient. The first one, um, uniformly isoniazid susceptible, and the second one, you see the isoniazid, isoniazid resistance uh, having emerged. So what we think was happening was that he was colonized with this mixed population. He went out and kind of acted as a super spreader, and really sort of depending on, you know, which tuberculous bacillus he coughed out, you would either get a susceptible or a resistant phenotype in the, the patient that he infected. Because we know that you know one tuberculous bacillus is sufficient to establish infection in some cases. So, you know, he could have been coughing out both, and it was just a matter of, you know, which was the, the lucky bug to land in your lung. So you you've talked, you've used this term super spreader several times, and I, I think we ought to talk about that a bit because I'm, I'm wondering whether you've learned anything from the genomics that would uh, explain why one individual might be more likely to, or, or is it entirely a matter of how that individual behaves socially mm -hmm. that accounts for uh, his or her propensity to, to make other people sick, uh, to, to correct, share his... Yeah. Share, share the bugs? It was the latter. Um, of our three individuals um, in the, uh, the latter outbreak, um, well, I guess the one that we studied and wrote up already, uh, those three folks had a couple of characteristics in common. Um, the primary one seemed to be a delay in diagnosis. Uh, so these were individuals that were symptomatic for a long period of time and infectious for a long period of time before they came to the attention of public health and were treated. So that was a big one. Um, one of the individuals was somebody that was misdiagnosed as having pneumonia and was out in the community the whole time. Um, one individual was sick for probably 10 or 11 months, and when we saw him, he had AFB4 plus pulmonary tuberculosis. So he was basically like a walking, spraying tuberculosis machine. And both of these would, would individuals... You, would you tell... What's... <laughs> I don't know, AFB. I've not heard that term before. Acid fast bacillus. So okay. uh, when we um, check your sputum, we count the number of tuberculous bacilli that we see in there, and AFB plus, AFB4 plus is basically the highest score you can get. Okay. It means your sputum is just rife with bacteria. So this guy was just spraying TB everywhere uh, for months, months and months and months. And the other thing that was interesting was all our super spreaders, in addition to having this prolonged infectious period, were uniformly 
socially popular. They were people that people wanted to be around. Um, so they were having contact with a lot of individuals. They were hanging out at you know, bars and houses and things for seven, eight well, hours. Well, they were selling crack cocaine, right? So they No, they had none of them were reason. dealers. No, oh. they, um, they were mostly users. Um, but yeah, they would be in houses sharing space with people for, you know, six, eight, ten hour stretches and they'd be coughing. Um, and two out of the three were crack cocaine uh, users. So they would, you know, inhale, they'd cough, TB bacilli would come out. This is not a good habit to no. If, if, you're, if you're a TB infected or exactly. any kind Even of if you're not infected, uh, TB actually puts you at increased risk of exposure to the tuberculous bacilli. So if you're at uh, a crack house, for example, and there's um, you know a TB patient in there and you are sharing airspace with them and you're all coughing. So not only are you at increased risk for exposure, um, your immune system is suppressed to a certain degree, usually malnourished, you're not in the greatest shape to begin with. Um, so still sociable. But that's, you're still sociable, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you're uh, at greater risk for exposure, greater risk of development of active disease, and greater risk of um, not recognizing that you have TB. You can mistake the symptoms for uh, the side effects of using crack cocaine, so you might not seek medical attention for a while. Okay. Now, I, this, this same approach, uh, or th this genomic epidemiology approach, are you, are you trying it uh, within are you a t maybe you're a TB specialist, but it seems as if it would be applicable to uh, all sorts of other epidemiologic uh, searches, those that would involve infectious mm -hmm. disease agents. And, and I'm wondering, where, where does this go next? What other kinds of applications would you have in mind? Yeah, we're trying it in a couple different uh, arenas right now. So um, one of the ones that we've got ongoing at the moment is the investigation of a big measles outbreak that we had um, in Vancouver right after the uh, Winter Olympic Games last year. Um, Vancouver general, well, British Columbia doesn't see uh, measles cases very often. When, they, when we do see them, they're imported cases that usually spread within um, unvaccinated populations. But what was unusual with this one is we had two separate introductions of measles, two separate genotypes, um, from visitors that had come from other countries to Vancouver for the Olympic Games and were celebrating in the big public spaces downtown and ended up seeding a number of cases which um, quite surprisingly spread throughout the province. Normally these things are contained in you know, a school or a community or something, but both of the genotypes spread from Vancouver in the very south of British Columbia all the way up to the north. It looks like they trickled into Alberta and Washington State as well. And people haven't really looked at the molecular epidemiology of measles in great detail um, in North America because it's sort of considered a solved problem, but obviously it's not a solved problem. It's a problem that keeps coming back and rearing its head progressively more frequently now, it seems. So that's going to be really, uh, really interesting. We've got a number of... Um, Let me just uh, stop you for a second. Mm -hmm. I was wondering... I so this measles was, was spreading through a vaccinated population or not? Uh, it was sort of a mixed bag uh, okay. in terms of vaccination status. Uh, the initial individuals that were uh, exposed and were infected and propagated the illness elsewhere uh, were unvaccinated, but then uh, we had some people that serologically should not have gotten measles but did. So it's kind of an interesting So there situation. might be something about the virus that circulated that's a bit different. I mean, you it would have be, yeah. information on it because you know it's genome sequence. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it was neat. There were two genotypes, uh, H1 and D8, and the, uh, the measles vaccine component is an A genotype. So we're wondering, you know, how different is it from other ones that are out there? Or was it just social factors again? So measles is something we're looking at. Again, we're doing a second tuberculosis outbreak. Um, we're getting into some MRSA stuff, uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Um, basically, sort of any any bug that's bugging British Columbia um, and has interesting and um, complete underlying epidemiological data, we're willing to, to give the approach a try. And I think there's other bugs that it's, it's certainly easier to do in. Um, tuberculosis is pretty tricky. It's basically a chronic infection. It's really difficult dealing with microevolutionary change in a bug that behaves differently in different individuals that might be in some people for a few weeks, some people for a few years. It's not a simple question where you've got this very acute 
infection where the bug goes into somebody, it's there for two weeks, it accrues a couple of mutations, it jumps to somebody else. It's a really tricky uh, situation. Well, it's a real slow mover, too. Mm -hmm. In general, it, it is a slow mover, much. yeah. Except um, in certain individuals, there was some really interesting work from friends of ours in the, the Netherlands when they did a, a paper a couple, I guess, about a year and a half ago now, on the within host uh, evolutionary rates of MTB, and they had a really nicely characterized transmission chain where um, you know patient A made B sick, who made C sick, and D and E, and in the early part of the chain, there was very little um, change in the bug. Basically, A's bug was passed on to B virtually intact. Then it went into patient C. And in patient C, it just accrued a pile of mutations. And that was somebody that uh, had those sort of environmental stressors at work in their life. They were somebody that was a very poor health. They weren't particularly compliant with their treatment. There were some other complicating factors that the authors um, put forward in the paper. But basically um, it sort of created this perfect environment for a microevolutionary burst and then when they transmitted on to the next individual it suddenly went stable again so tb acts in very odd ways that we don't fully understand uh, that, that's an interesting finding that the environment would make it that much more uh, would change its effective mutation rate uh, because because of selection pressure but uh, but still it's you wouldn't think that one individual host would be that different from another. Yeah, it's weird. We need a lot more studies in this area and a lot more on to what TB is doing when it's latent as well. Because, you know, there are some periods where people will have these sort of latent infections for a while. Is anything happening? Is anything not happening? Um, what happens when the disease suddenly activates? We really don't know enough about it to kind of apply any sort of molecular clock to our data. We can just sort of look at it and make our best guess right now. All right. It, it, do we have any questions in the room? It doesn't seem as if we do. We have a question from the web, and Jim Sliwa will share that question with us. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's been answered complete, uh, completely or not, but uh, Twitter user Tifi wants to know, is it crack cocaine use that reactivates TB, or is it other lifestyle um, variables? Uh, it's basically immune suppression due to drug use and all the other things that go on top of that, too. You can't really tease out one thing um, because these were individuals that um, many of them were using crack cocaine, many of them were abusing alcohol, many of them were underhoused, um, living in abject poverty, really, in some cases. So it's impossible to take one factor out of that and say that's what caused the reactivation. Um, but we could generally say that, okay, this community was roughly equivalent in terms of poverty level, housing, um, alcohol use for decades. And then the one factor that did change just before the outbreak was crack cocaine use. So that was probably one of the big contributors, um, especially as our social network analysis did identify a series of crack houses as key uh, foci for transmission. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Right, I was wondering. Um, you want to identify yourself? Oh, sorry, please. I'm Tina Say with Science News Magazine. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, given that this was a, a rather old outbreak and you had treated uh, all the people and um, presumably they are no longer infected with TB. Correct. Yeah. Um, so why undertake this investigation that's, you know, pretty complex um, it, if uh, it, you know, no longer matters for preventing uh, further spread? Yeah, um, it's a good question, and one, I mean, this was done as sort of an applied research project because we all had an inkling um, that genome sequencing could tell us some really interesting things about an outbreak that was essentially a mystery. So it was a bit of a, a fishing, a retrospective fishing expedition, but we knew that um, whatever came out would be pretty informative moving forward uh, in terms of our TB control practices. So we kind of went on this search just to see like, hey, I wonder what really did happen in this outbreak. You know, let's get a research grant and, and find out. Um, and what it ended up showing us was the importance of individuals that were socially well connected as um, key people to investigate when you're going out in the field. So 
we've got this TB outbreak that's going on right now, and from our previous outbreak, the lesson learned that you know so highly social individuals are really important to contact has actually shaped how our epidemiologists have gone out and investigated this second outbreak and how they've prioritized um, people for social network uh, questionnaires, how they've prioritized them for uh, TST, uh, tuberculin skin test um, screening procedures. So. It was a bit of a, a retrospective fishing expedition, but we knew the results would be informative going forward. And ultimately, what we're hoping to do is um, start doing this more in real time. I mean, the ongoing outbreak, I consider kind of a quasi real time investigation because it started about two years ago and we're only just getting around to the genome sequencing and stuff now. Um, but we would like to do it more prospectively um, and just build up a knowledge base of how does tuberculosis and other things like measles um, behave in different communities with different underlying social network structures? Because I think that's one of the, the keys to this emerging area of genomic epidemiology is it can really help us to reconstruct outbreaks um, at a quite detailed level um, to a degree that we've never been able to do before. And as we collect more data on how different organisms behave in different populations, we'll actually start to really kind of build up a, an encyclopedia of pathogen transmission dynamics. And information like that is absolutely critical for evidence-based um, control and prevention of future outbreaks. So right now we're kind of in the, the data harvesting stage, but I think over the years uh, we'll be able to use it more in real time and take the evidence that we've collected and use it as part of our public health management strategies. And then I was also wanting to ask, how different were the A and B groups, and did you see much change in the TB as uh, it spread throughout the community? Uh, the A and B groups were pretty um, pretty similar to each other. The the TB bacteria itself um, you know, uniformly fell out into two clades, the A clade and the B clade. Uh, within each clade, there was roughly the same amount of diversity. Um, the clades didn't differ at all, or lineage A and lineage, lineage B didn't differ at all in terms of demographic factors or anything. It, they were, for all intents and purposes, just the same uh, population. And we think there were actually a couple people that were um, mixed A and B co-infections as well. Um, what's the second part of your question? Oh, did it change? Um, it did a little bit. What was interesting in lineage A was that um, when we looked at the phylogenetic tree, there was a reasonable amount of diversity in there, but we could track um, most of those cases back to a single individual. And at first, we were like, well, how did this one person generate so much genomic diversity? But then when we looked at um, the time of symptom onset and the date of sample collection, it's sort of hard to explain without a figure in front of me. Unfortunately, I don't have one. But you could basically see that this individual had been sick and capable of transmitting disease for a period that was essentially about a year. Um, and he sequentially infected different people that fell out at different points on the phylogenetic tree in sort of a beautiful little circle. It was like a perfect clock. You could see who he had infected first and second and third and how that diversity had accrued. And he fell out um, towards the bottom of the tree. You would expect a source case to fall out at the top of the tree. Um, but he fell out near the bottom, but that's because we sampled him quite late in the outbreak, and he had had all this diversity that had accrued up to that point that was captured in the infections that he engendered in other people, um, but he ended up being at the bottom of the phylogenetic tree. That was really cool when we found that. It's a pity for somebody to fall out of a phylogenetic tree. I know, you hit you your head on the way down. <laughs> we have another question in the room. Yeah, well, speaking of phylogeny, uh, Jonathan Eisen, UC Davis. Um, actually, I have a question about, the, you mentioned you're processing samples from, say, two years ago, mm -hmm. and the goal is to possibly do this in real time. What, what would you need <laughs> to do this in an, I mean, obviously not instantaneous, but what would you need in terms of uh, technological developments, bioinformatic developments, where are the bottlenecks in this such that you would eventually try to do this in a much quicker manner? 
Definitely. Um, right now, the major bottleneck is that in order to get enough genomic material for sequencing, you've got to grow up a fair amount of tuberculosis in culture, and that takes about six weeks or so. So right away, you've got a month and a half delay in getting genome sequence, and um, I hope they're not listening, but our Genome Sciences Center has a really big bottleneck, too, in BC. So just to get something, you know, once we've extracted the DNA and sent it down, it's sometimes a few months before we get the data back. So um, if we had a way of getting enough material out of a very small amount of tuberculosis and concentrating it down, um, and then sequencing that in-house would be really great. So PHSA, if you're listening and need money for a sequencer, um, that would be great. I think that would probably be the biggest thing. The bioinformatics is pretty fast. Um, thanks to our collaboration with the Brinkman Lab, stuff gets processed you know, right away, and we get our nice little package of SNPs back. I mean, you can essentially reduce an entire outbreak's worth of genomes down to 200 or so letters per individual. So it's actually, you know, once you get to that point, it's pretty easy to analyze and process these things. I mean, you could do it in a day, but really it's, it's growing the bugs and getting the bugs sequenced. So have, you, have you tried culture-independent methods? That, you, know, you, you, should, <laughs> you should be on microphone for the people yeah. who aren't. So, so have you tried culture-independent methods to generate the sequence data, such as just straight metagenomics or amplifying samples and then doing metagenomics on them with cheap and cheap sequencing, although you need a sequencer, obviously, yeah. but with cheaper <laughs> sequencing, the fact that you sequence other stuff doesn't matter that much. Exactly. No, we haven't tried it yet. We do have um, an idea. Uh, we've got some great colleagues who actually have a booth here, Boreal Genomics, um, and they are working on really interesting DNA concentration methods. So we've been talking with them. They're um, engineers and physicists, and so we're like, how can we process our sputum quickly and suck out what little bit of DNA is in there and concentrate it down so that we can sequence it right away from, you know, a few bugs. So we're going to be playing with that over the next little while, but for this current outbreak, we're already growing the bugs up anyway, so. Okay, we've got two final questions and then we're going to wrap this up. Hi, I'm David Mulder from McMaster University. Um, you sort of already answered it, but in terms of the absolute SNP diversity, mm -hmm. so there wasn't enough for your standard, more classical genotyping methods. Um, is there enough diversity in the in these chronic sort of infection, um, well, uh, cases that you're looking at? Is there enough there to to sort of pull out more complicated pictures for more complicated profiles for when you have a lot of patients? or a lot of um, infected individuals, or is it only, like, are there only enough SNPs to really get a good picture when there's only, say, 20 key individuals at play? There's a, there's a fair amount. Um, one thing that I've learned from genomic epidemiology and the few studies that have come out of different bacteria so far is that even with just a tiny handful, sometimes, you know, three, four, or five SNPs is sufficient to reconstruct an outbreak. Um, so in our case, we had about 200. Um, many of these were uninformative SNPs in that they only arose in a single individual. Um, but it, there was certainly enough to identify individual transmission events and come up with a variety of tiny little subclusters. So yeah, there's definitely enough genomic diversity to play with. And you know, you're looking at the 99.97% of the genome that's ignored by genotyping. So um, you know, no matter what organism you're looking at, you're always going to find a lot more informative diversity with whole genome sequence than with uh, genotyping, even if it's something like 24 loci, miru, and the most sophisticated things that we've got. And just one other thing. So the first thing you talked about was a retrospective study, and now you're doing a quasi sort of real time. Mm -hmm. Do you sort of foresee in the future as sequencing becomes even better, uh, very real time and, and more worldwide, worldwide collaboration between the different um, centers for disease control around the world and, and really monitoring these cases that especially for like the Olympics when you have populations moving through. Yeah, no, I, that's really sort of my vision for the, the future of public health. Um, it's my selfish vision because that's what I understand and can do and I'd like to have a job for the rest of my life. Um, but yeah, that, that's where I hope we go. I think um, 
you know, genotyping on a global level has been fairly successful for some pathogens more so than others, but um, with tuberculosis, for example, you've got a great database where you can go in, enter your pattern, and see, okay, what's it most similar to around the world? And I think um, there will be some struggles, obviously, because whole genome sequence is a little bit more difficult to um, capture in kind of web readable formats and web interpretable formats, but um, yeah, I. I can imagine that by the time I retire, we'll be routinely sequencing stuff and sharing it around the world instantly. Okay. And I'd like to retire soon. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take our last question. Uh, yeah, Dan Rice from Ann Arbor, uh, University of Michigan. So, so you've spoken beautifully to how these new sequencing technologies have increased the granularity of producing phylogeny trees and getting a, a good sense of how these strains are emerging and moving around. Mm -hmm. Can you speak at all to how new sort of social media technologies have helped make your social interviews and social network uh, modeling or design a little bit more granular? Do you foresee that as in the future becoming a more, being able to give you a more refined look at where risks are happening, where context ex exposures are happening, that kind of thing? Yeah, with TB it's a bit tricky because um, Tuberculosis outbreaks generally occur in sort of marginalized and vulnerable populations, and they don't have Facebook accounts or MySpace or LinkedIn. Um, what we were doing with these folks, um, when we talk about social network analysis, it's a very um, sort of a, a patient-centric narrative uh, that we like to get them to give. Traditionally, in tuberculosis contact inves investigations, you just go and you say, who are all the people that live in your house? Who are all the people that you work with? Who are all the friends that you spend time with? And in populations like these, there often isn't a household structure. There isn't a, a work environment. Um, their close friends, they may be unwilling to name their names because they use drugs together, or they may be unable to name names because they know them as street names. So what we do is instead of asking them for a list of names, we sit down with them and we say, okay, well, you know, tell me about when you woke up on Monday, what was the first place you went? What did you do there? Who did you see there? How much time did you spend there? And you basically go through um, the course of a week or a couple weeks with them and sort of build up a picture of their lives. And that helps them to recall the people that they see, identify um, people, places, and locations that might be important for the outbreak. And it really doesn't interface at all with sort of what we think of as traditional social networking stuff. Where I think that would be interesting, though, is there's a whole sort of movement afoot. Um, James Fowler and Nicholas Christakis are doing some really interesting stuff in this area of understanding how different social network structures uh, shape the spread of infectious disease. So they did some beautiful work recently on uh, influenza in a social network at Harvard University, and they hypothesized um, quite rightly, it turned out that individuals that were highly connected in the social network would act as sentinel nodes, and they would be exposed to an illness before people at the periphery of the network, kind of the, the losers with no friends, um, they would see the disease first. That, that's what we call them in network terminology. Um, <laughs> but they weren't losers in terms of being invincible. They just got sick two yeah. weeks after the sentinel uh, nodes, uh, is what Fowler and Christakis showed. So they still got sick, and they got they sick still with get sick nobody to bring them chicken soup either. So it really did suck to be them. Boo hoo. Uh, but yeah, really interesting stuff there. So I think you could probably harness some of these social um, networking websites if they were able to kind of map and anonymize their data and dump out maps of different social structures, you could do some really interesting data gathering on just general population movements, population structures, how do you know urban college students differ in their number of social connections than you know rural senior citizens. And you could use those as the substrates for some mathematical modeling exercises that I think would be pretty interesting. All right. Well fascinating if you uh, if you don't have friends you get sick anyway so uh, <laughs> so make friends and <clears throat> take take um, vitamin C I don't know wash your hands uh, we've been uh, this is uh, the end of another session of ASM live we've been talking with Jennifer Gardy of the British Columbia Center's Center for Disease Control thanks very much for joining us we have another session coming up in about 20 minutes Bye, Mom. Bye, Dad. <laughs>